So welcome back, everyone. If you're just joining us, this is the uh, League of Women Voters, AAUW Forum for the open positions on our Port Townsend City Council. I'm Shelley Randall, your moderator. And um, I'm going to also have an, uh, another, address another point of order um, that in city council, for our city council, my understanding is that each position is an open position. So you don't, you're not from any particular district or geographic area within uh, our city limits. Uh, there are position numbers. And the last position that we just heard from was position six. six and this is position three. So if that is helpful, now you know. Also, the names are definitely grouped together on your ballot. So uh, we just have the two candidates running for position three. We have our incumbent, Deborah Stinson, and she is uh, on your right. We have our challenger, Monica McHager, on your left. So same format as before. Two minute opening statements from each candidate. Um, we have a timekeeper here indicating one minute and a red card means time is up at two minutes, at which point you may finish your sentence but not your thought, and please do finish your sentence. Um, and then you'll have, uh, each candidate has two minutes to respond to each question that I will be asking. I have mostly audience submitted questions up here. Closing statements will be one minute long from each candidate, and don't let us forget that. The candidates cannot debate each other. There's no back and forth. They just have a chance to state their position so that you may hear it. And I thought that last uh, round was very informative, so I look forward to this one. Without further ado then, I'm going to have um, our incumbent get us started. Ms. Stinson, would you please give your opening statement? Sure, yes, I am Deborah Stinson, and I am running for re-election to city council. And I believe that my unique experience, along with the skills and relationships that I have developed over the last eight years, will serve us well in the next four years as we go through a time of transition with our new city manager. I was first asked to uh, run for city council back in 2012 because of the volunteer work that I had been doing on emergency preparedness, climate change, and local economic development. And I felt I was effective in those efforts because of the decades of experience that I had in managing complex projects, teams, and budgets in both the public and private sector. So since accepting the responsibilities of public office, my board assignments have built on my experience in public safety, climate change, and economic development, and I have now made significant contributions through governing in those arenas. The council has selected me to be mayor twice, and I have presided over and actively participated in major projects that have brought pro positive change to city, city government. I know where we've been, and I know where we're headed, and I understand what it takes to get complex projects from, from concept to reality within the rules, regulations, and finances that frame our work. I've also seen how those rules, though well-intentioned, can sometimes uh, impede progress. And so where it's within our purview, I've acted to change rules so we can get more done. And it was through my leadership that our hiring profile for the city manager reflected the skills to execute our updated strategic plan, as well as the public's desire that was desires that were articulated through a robust public process. So I offer what the next council needs, the knowledge I have developed in my focus areas and the local and regional relationships of trust that I have forged will only grow in value during this time of change. I ask for your vote. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Hager, your opening statement, please. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> Good evening. I have two minutes to introduce myself, tell you why I'm running, and what I would do if elected. On your chair was my campaign card with my 34 years of public service in our community that prepared me to be on city council. It also includes issues that I feel are important to our town and are not being addressed. If you all take it home, my website and my Facebook addresses are on it. Over these last months campaigning, I have posted ideas and solutions to many issues that are before our city. Please read them. This is a simple way to learn why I am running and what, I, and what I'll do on city council. Two minutes is just not enough. 
Deciding to vote for Deborah or for me is very, very simple. As we've campaigned these last five months, we've shown that we are very different candidates bringing very different solutions for the issues. Deborah is for continuing to do just what City Council has been doing for the last eight years. She says we aren't in too much debt. She says the reasons our streets have been ignored for years is that there is no money. But there seems to have been enough money to beautify downtown and leave us $17 million in the hole. I'm for change. The least expensive and most productive solution for our affordable housing crisis has always been up to our city council. Review and simplify our zoning and building codes. I will also work to get our city debt down, pay, <clears throat> paying $1 million Seven, $1,700,000 a year for our general obligation debt service is a lot of money that could be used for, the real, for real improvements and repairs. Let's have real public participation again at City Council. Let's have town hall meetings again. Oh, and time is up. Time is up for your opening statement, thank you. Um, but I am going to ask you the next question. You can stay standing if you'd like. And we're gonna jump right into hearing more about this. This is what people came here to hear. And I'm going to ask the question, what priorities do you have for your term on the council? What I've heard at doorbells is affordable housing. So I think it's first and foremost something I'd like to focus on. Much stronger and deeper, and as I just said, we have it, an inexpensive way to start immediately. Being on the Planning Commission for the last 10 years and working and doing the review on the comp plan, what we learned reviewing the comp plan for 20 years is that the codes have not been looked at. We've asked for three years to have City Council let us look at those and review them. I think it's an important job to start. I think we have to change our priorities so that we do have money to repair our streets. We need to pick priorities that are going to affect all of us in town and improve our lives, which means we have to say on a project, who's gonna get better from this? Who is this really gonna help? And it needs to reach all of us. I uh, share the priority with our community on affordable housing. That's job number one because it affects every aspect of what's going on in our community as far as economic development, um, health, wellness, every front. And we are working on that on many planes and we are starting to address the codes and zoning issues that were mentioned. Uh, we're also working on other, many other aspects of it as far as fee waivers, and other investments in that area. So I'm also working with others across the community. It's a community-wide effort. It's not just the city. The city has a definite role to play, and I think we're playing that well. Uh, one of the things that we do, though, is also um, improve the conditions for jobs. That was also the number one thing when I was doorbelling is there weren't enough jobs. And everything that we do in this city and all the investments we've made, and I'm sure we'll get to the debt, have really gone to the point where we're going to be um, investing in things that are going to generate commerce and generate more taxes to apply to the things that we all want. And of course, climate change that was brought up before has to run through a current of everything that we do. Uh, I've been very active in working on climate change. We've made some very specific uh, actions already. We have new ones in the hopper, and one of the things that we're definitely going to be doing, and I'm going to be working with our new manager, who has a great strength in this, is to make sure every decision we make is considering the impacts of climate change and either we're going to be mitigating or adapting for it. Um, and the other thing we have to do is also figure out how to sustain our other facilities, like the recreational facilities of parks and pools, and make sure, again, those are very critical parts of making this um, a place where young families will thrive and survive. <laughs> and um, we have to do everything we can to make the quality of life for all our residents a step above, and everything we do has that in mind. Okay. Thank you. Well, you may stay standing, okay. uh, Ms. Dinson. We'll have you answer the next question. You've already alluded to our the new city manager, uh, John Morrow. So go ahead and say what kinds of changes you're looking forward to with our new city manager. I think our new city manager is going to bring a real new spark of life 
to City Hall. Um, we had a, a, our first city manager was brought in for certain tasks and he did those tasks very well and got a lot done for this city. But the ch times they are changing and we have new needs. And one of the things I heard, we heard loud and clear from the community was this uh, ability for our city manager to be out and mixing it up and getting engaged in the community more so than our past uh, manager was able to do. And I'm, I'm every, I have every confidence that he is going to do that, but I also expect him to bring the certain skills that we hired him for inside City Hall. There's a lot of work that needs to be done there. I think our staff is going to really enjoy working with him. I think there, he's going to invigorate some uh, new energy on making some of the process changes that we need to be making internally. And um, I want him to definitely open up his toolbox, his, his sustainability officer's manager toolbox, and make sure we're just doing everything possible that we can to address our challenges with climate change. And we have already, um, I think I'll leave it with that right now. Okay, thanks. And Ms. Mag Ms. Hag Ms. McHager, uh, same question to you. What kinds of changes are you looking forward to with our new city manager? Well, I agree with all three of the candidates tonight that I have great hopes that our new city manager is going to want to join our community in a public way and become one of us and someone we see at our festivals and on our streets. So we can cross our fingers about that, but I guess we have to wait and see. What I'm truly hoping is that we have a city manager who is invested in public participation and wants to listen to the community, not just about the things we all love, but about the things that we don't love and that we want to see change and how are we going to change. And that means I want a city manager who's not excluding us from the process and is inviting us into the process more, is delighted to go back to town meetings like we used to have, really get our input. This is one of the smartest communities I've ever been exposed to. We have brilliant ideas. No one person has to have the idea. We can all work together, but we have to be inclusive. Another question, this is kind of, we're still in the generalities here, and Ms. Mc, Ms. I'm sorry about That's that. That's right, it's me. Ms. Mick Hager. You can call me Monica. I'm fine with it. I've already gone down the road of Ms. and Mr. So okay. uh, the formality stands. Um, please talk about the city budget, how you hope to help shape it, and how you hope citizens can have input to it. I know the city council, it's one of their main jobs. They spend months reviewing and drafting to come to their final vote, which is somewhere, I believe, in December. So it's a big part of their their work they do all year. We need a budget where we are spending the money that is helping with the most of us. That I know, and I don't feel we've had that. The other problem with the budget is we are not living within our means. And because we have not been living within our means, city council over the last 19 years has continued to take out debt to where we now carry $17 million. I believe we need to pay that debt down. We need to make a budget that we live within so we can start working on repair of roads, sidewalks in all our neighborhoods. Bathrooms would be wonderful in all of our neighborhoods, public bathrooms. Thank you. Would uh, contend that we don't live without outside our means. We have to balance our budget every year, and we do. The challenge is addressing all the many needs that we have and doing so legally within um, each of the funds. The, each of the funds that we have has to be dedicated in certain ways. Not all money can be used for all purposes. Some of them are very specific, uh, specifically when you're looking at the utilities, any of the enterprise funds that come in from rates for water, sewer, et cetera. It's very limited on them. What you, you can only spend it on those things and you can only cover your costs. You can't make a profit. Um, and the same is true for things like lodging tax. Lodging tax has to be spent on tourism. It cannot be spent any other ways. You can't put it on a residential street. So we have to take all of those things into account. And when you look at debt, I would just like to say that debt is kind of the way government gets your tax dollars to work for you today. Uh, you bond the money. When you know you have a certain income stream, you can do a bond so that you can actually put the work today so 
while you're paying taxes, you are enjoying the benefits of what those taxes are doing rather than us squirreling it away and saving it for when we finally have enough money to do something long after you're gone. So that is, that is the standard way of doing things. Port Townsend is audited every year and we are well within the financial uh, limits and what the auditors like to see is you have a certain amount of debt to show you're getting the job done you're you're spending your money wisely but you have to do it in a, within a certain ratio of um, debt to um, valuation and we're always well within those guidelines let's go on ahead and uh, also of course this is this is on the budget uh, on the budget topic I'll ask the same question from the last uh, forum why did the city update Water Street, and how come the city never fixes the residential streets? And let's see, that one falls to you to answer right first. Sure. Uh, this goes back to the different pockets of money that are available to us. So uh, when we do things like Water Street, we have a responsibility to maintain the, the uh, arterials, the main commerce areas. There are certain streets that get funding from state and federal sources and they have to be streets of that nature because those streets are vital for your public safety access as well as to conduct commerce that that you know allows business to happen and generate more taxes that can go into the general fund that can be used elsewhere um, so that is why many times you'll see a project taking place on the arterials is because there's actually money available to do that and that money is you're taking your small amount of local dollars and magnifying it five six seven times with state and federal money you're bringing your state and federal taxes dollar dollars back here those streets are also not only just providing a street to drive on but they're also providing a lot of infrastructure underneath as was mentioned last time with water mains and all of the conduit for electricity and broadband and, and things of that nature so those are critical streets that need to be done as far as residential streets there is not funding available there has not been a funding source for residential streets since the first uh, ta uh, initiative that eliminated uh, car tabs reduced car tabs to thirty dollars the funding for local streets went away it was never replaced we have been struggling with that since before I was on council and um, streets were identified as one of the primary things we would take care of um, should you allow us to use the money that we um, the the banked capacity that came to us uh, on our property taxes through the fire annexation. So we've been looking at this, we're trying to find, and again, if you have a dedicated funding stream like that, you can bond and you can put together a plan and you can do it. But $100,000 here and $100,000 there isn't even gonna fix half a block. Uh, so Ms. McHager, uh, you get to answer this question. Why did the city update Water Street and how come the city never fixes the residential streets? My personal belief on why so much of our money and now the debt we carry is located down on Water Street is because towns our size look for federal grants. And federal grants are only given for capital projects. Our federal government will not give any of our towns money for maintenance. As the years have gone on, having a city manager that's now retired here for 20 years, staff started just putting forward projects that they could get grants for. And so now we're down the road. And what we see now is what we have. We have major work done in commercial area, which yes, we got money for. And yes, we had to match it. And yes, we didn't have all the money we needed to match it, so we are in debt from it, and we don't have any maintenance done. Towns our size have to start taking care of ourselves. We have to start doing our own maintenance. It's the only way it's gonna happen. We have to start budgeting immediately. For the last eight years, there has been nothing more than $50,000 a year budgeted, and that's to chip 90 miles of road. We have to completely turn around how we think about what our priorities are, what's best for our community, all of us, not just some of us. And we have to start right away. We can do this. So um, thank you again to KPTZ for being here and recording this so that even more of our city residents can hear it. 
Let's have a question. So I'm going to try to fit in two. Um, I'm your average abnormal citizen, everyone. And uh, the first question is, I kind of get that in. Um, the first question is that there have been a lot of talk about how city council is doing a lot of things in private uh, as opposed to public, and that these decisions are basically made by the mayor as to what is public and what is private. What I like to understand is to what extent the decisions that are made are actually representative of the council as a whole, as opposed to just the mayor's whim. So I want to understand to what extent that criticism is justified. All right, I don't know if I can really answer the question because I'm not on city council. So I don't really know if it's the mayor making these decisions or not. What I do know from watching city council very closely, particularly for the last four years, is I see no dialogue between our council members. I see us going through the agenda and there is no discussion and votes come very quickly. They're usually 6-1 and they move on very quickly. And I question, where are they talking to each other and why is it not in front of us? That's the best answer I can give you for that. Well, I will say that uh, the city has received open uh, public meetings awards for our tr level of transparency. We were the only one on the peninsula for quite some time to actually receive that kind of an award. We always hold open public meetings. We do not talk behind the scenes. Um, oftentimes, we're all doing our own homework. We're studying the issues. Uh, we have our, each one of us has met our own uh, people out in the community that we talk to, our own opportunities to be out there to help form our decisions. And by the time we get there, there just might, we, there, we have had some pretty spirited conversations, but sometimes by the time somebody's paying attention, it might be the third or fourth time we've actually touched an issue. And so we've had the dialogue months before. As far as the mayor running the agenda, and I've seen this online that people say it's the mayor gets to run the agenda and pick what's, that, that is not the case. The mayor is, a, is asked to serve the council. The council makes the decisions. The council sets the priorities, and we do all of that in open public meetings. What does happen is that the mayor and the deputy mayor sits down uh, once a week with staff and the city manager and the attorney and everybody else to kind of figure out, okay, these are all the things we have to get done. They're either mandated or time limited or council priorities. How are, how are we going to get them scheduled, right? How do we get them fit onto our twice a month business schedule or once a month workshop to get everything done? It's more of a task of just figuring out what staff is available, what, you know, what things are coming down the pike, but it is definitely not the mayor calling the shots on what the priorities are or what we're going to be discussing. Thank you a lot. Um, when are we going to have parking meters downtown? Well, that's a good question. It is an issue that we are looking at. I know it's frustrating people. We've been wanting this done for quite a while. Our former city manager looked into several different options for doing parking enforcement. Uh, parking meters might not be the specific thing, but we are looking at a parking management system. I think it's going to need to be a comprehensive approach, frankly. I don't know if it'll be paid parking downtown. I don't know if it'll be a matter of doing something a little bit more robust and innovative with using our park and ride and our shuttle system systems from using shuttles from the park and ride, especially for employees to free up more parking. I understand the motivation of wanting to do paid parking to encourage people to get out of their cars. That's great. But in our demographic, we need to make sure that that's um, going to be workable and that we're not causing equity issues by charging people to have to come downtown and park. Uh, so there's a lot to be done there. And it has been tasked now to our new transportation committee. And there's going to be a lot of robust uh, conversation around that in the community and, and by the way uh, that is one of the things that came up in our city manager interview and it, he he talked about his you know uh, parking strategies that he's he's uh, run into a lot of those so I'm really looking forward to actually some better ideas coming forward because frankly the ones I did hear about uh, that we first looked at I don't think people here would have been um, I don't think they would have been well received as far as uh, privacy and equity issues. So we do want to get that addressed, but it's now uh, at the Transportation Committee. So and a couple of those committee members are here this evening, so you could talk to them about that. Okay. 
Well, we have seen parking meters downtown. It was a long time ago. Maybe most of you don't remember it. Cynthia remembers it. Um, I think we ought to have paid parking downtown, and that might have cost me a vote or two in this room. I see it as a wonderful opportunity for us to really partner with transit. I remember when we had transit in the early days. There was a bus, a shuttle bus, every 15 minutes downtown. My kids lived on the bus. They could get anywhere for 25 cents. We don't have buses on Sunday. We have buses that stop at 10 o'clock at night. So workers can't take buses to get to and from work. Maybe if we just, th first off, I think we have to have a community dialogue about this. Mm -hmm. Let's see about this. What if we could have a real transit system being paid for by parking downtown and all of us could actually use it and it's available for us to use? It's a concept. And I want right now to disagree, thank you, Transportation and having parking downtown has been before our city council for years. Our non-transportation advisory board has brought up many different ways that they wanted to try. They could never get the support from the, our city manager, but mainly they never get the support from city council. Our city council sets the agenda, not staff. I would be really curious to hear, each of you and Ms. McHager, you get to start, um, to discuss your priorities for partnering with our other uh, government agencies here in Jefferson County. So you mentioned Jefferson Transit, but there's also the county, the fire district, the port, the hospital, Jeffcom, et cetera. I think we should partner with anybody that wants to partner with us. That's what we do best in this community is think together. I think we do partner with many of these different organizations in many of the cities around us. It is something I listen to city council members speak of at the end of their meetings when they talk about the meetings that they're representing us at. This is something that needs to be continued and it's something we need to expand on. We need to include partnering with our community. That seems to have been lost. Well, I do think uh, we are doing a good job with partnering with all of our neighboring jurisdictions. I think the relationships uh, between the county and the city and the port and the city have been improved over the last several years, and I, can, I see that just on an upswing. That was another opportunity with our new city manager. We get a fresh start there on the staff level as well. So I, I think we have made some good inroads there. Right now we're in discussions, for instance, with partnerships looking at the hospital, working with the hospital and the schools and the county and the YMCA on trying to solve the problem with our pool. That's a great example of a partnership that needs to be explored. That's one of the areas where we can do that work. I also have found great ex um, uh, advantage in partnering, like you say, regionally um, with the North Olympic Development Council, that is the two county region where I've chaired an economic development group for several years now and we work very collaboratively together one of the things we brought is a whole focus on broadband we're also now working on workforce development um, we're looking at um, healthy agriculture practices and supporting our ag um, our ag businesses as well as transportation we're looking at doing an ev charging loop uh, for electronic vehicles to help with climate change and, and uh, move us towards that. So there's a lot of opportunities to partner, and I'm, I love partnering. I think that's the only way we're going to get to, to, uh, to, we're a small community. I always say, you know, 30,000 people, that's not even a small city. Come on, we all have to work together. We have these artificial layers in our government structure here in Washington, but we're all in this together, and we have to find ways to, to Take, it, take advantage of each other's strengths and to hold each other up where we have weaknesses or challenges. We've had uh, an affordable housing problem for many, many years, and it just keeps getting worse all the time. And I would like to know not whether you're supportive of working on it, but I would like to know if either one of you have specific ideas that would help at this point. 
Yes, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different people in our community. Like I say, this is going to take us all to solve this. We can't, none of us can do it alone. We've talked about what we've done in the city. I think it's very important that we kind of stay in our lane there as far as doing fee waivers, doing the zoning, the code changes that are now in process, um, that we um, work on the infrastructure, getting infrastructure in the ground as close to buildable properties as we can. That's all the electric, sewer, plumb, you know, water. It's very expensive. It's one of the big barriers to getting th uh, things built. Uh, but I'm also working like with the Jefferson Community Foundation. They have a housing solutions network now where there's a lot of great brainstorming going on. And the one project that I'm working on, it's been a passion of mine, gosh, since before I was on council was to come up with a, an find a way to help some of our existing housing stock be better better utilized. We have a lot of underutilized housing in this community and we're trying working really hard to identify what the barriers to that are and probably put together some kind of a agency that can help people that have property make that open that property up and make it more available. It's a little com more complicated than I can go into here, but I think having that kind of bridge and then doing everything we can to support the building that needs to happen again with code changes uh, surplusing our land, which we have done, um, and just, you know, everybody has to be working on this full force, and that is one of the overarching things that we'll be looking at, kind of like climate change. Is this addressing, you know, every issue that we're looking at? How does this affect the affordable housing issue, and how do we move that forward? And I will say affordable means it's also accessible. We need housing on the full spectrum, all the way from the homeless or those teetering on homelessness, all the way up to the professionals. I mean, the right now, the hospital can't hire nurses and doctors because there's no housing. Well, I said in my opening, and I believe it, that it's been before City Council one of the best ways to work on affordable housing is working on reviewing our zoning and our codes. Planning Commission sent five uh, changes to coding to City Council, and that was over a year ago. And it, just two weeks ago, it's gotten on City Council's radar, and they're now going to discuss those. They sat somewhere with them having no time to look at it. This is a good fix. This is a fix we can do, and it will help immediately. The other thing I've learned at doorbells when I'm doorbelling is how many people have a home, have a mortgage, and are terrified they're going to lose it. Their taxes are going up. The property taxes are going up. City Council is looking at over and over again. They're looking at right now to uh, add more taxes to the utility rates that we already pay. Um, in the next Three, four years, I don't have it in front of me. There's 370 odd dollars that's going to be added to our property taxes and to our utility taxes that they've already voted in this year. This is making people lose their homes and they are now becoming homeless. This is something we need to look at as a community to keep it open and inclusive to everyone. We have to be incredibly clear and fair and understand that to be inclusive, we have to have everyone in all different brackets be able to afford to live here. Um, there's a really important case right now in front of the Supreme Court that has to do with LGBTQ equality. If the Supreme Court comes down against equal rights for LGBTQ people, um, on religious grounds or whatever grounds, it seems that half the, the discussion was around bathrooms in, during the Supreme Court hearing. And I've read several commentary about that, of people going, is this all they talk about? What bathrooms do we use? Um, are you in favor of city council and the city passing a resolution affirming rights, the inalienable rights of all people, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, or gender? Absolutely, 100%. Yes, I think there's no question that our record is that, um, that we have the Human Rights Index record, that we, you know, we have a record of that kind of support, and I don't think that would ever change. So I'm definitely in support. All right, another person steps up to the mic. Another person, Scott Walker. Uh, as you know, 40% of our greenhouse gases 
come from our transportation system, more or less. And I just came from my own personal hell yesterday, uh, driving back from the gorge through Camas, Vancouver, and then Battleground. And it was one five-lane intersection after another five-lane intersection. I see it heading this way via Silverdale, via Squim. I'm scared to death of living in a community that's car-oriented, so car-oriented that it destroys what we live here for. How would you address that? Well, we've started. Every project that we have taken on with our streets has included improving our sidewalks, adding bike lanes. We do as much as we can. When the state was here to work on Sims Way, we insisted that they add the bike lanes and the, and the uh, curb cuts to make it uh, not just for bicycles, but also much more pedestrian friendly. Uh, you know, part of what you're talking about too, when we talk about the visitor center downtown and the, the project that's going on downtown, that also was around safety. That was a very unsafe intersection area and that now has walkability added to it. And we also put in an EV charging station there because not everybody, we recognize not everybody in our community is going to be able to uh, bicycle or walk, but electronic vehicles is going to be another great way to do that, and we need to get that infrastructure in place as well. We also need to be encouraging a much stronger transit system. We need a real regional transit system, and I think that is one of the things that I would like to see move forward in the coming years, and I would pledge to work pretty hard with uh, transit and the uh, state to make sure that we can get that in place. A very dear friend of mine said to me, and it was a great impact on me as people smart in our community are educating me and can educate all of us know a lot about transportation. We're either gonna plan for cars and traffic or we plan for people and places. As a city, right now, we're planning for cars and traffic. It's what the state does too. We have to get together as a community and talk about how we want our roads to be. Because right now, we're building them for cars. And we're not building them for the people that walk it and the people that ride their bikes. And there's a lot of us out there, and it's getting greater and greater in number. I want a place that is safe, it's comfortable, that I can walk in, and that buses will take me to all places. Back to transit. Back to that terrible idea that we pay for parking downtown and every penny of that goes to transit. So we have a transit seven days a week that will take us places, that reaches out regionally and we can get there. This is our way to deal with people. They're not going to stop coming to the Olympic Peninsula. It was wonderful all those years. We were so far, far away, but we're not. So we have to be active. We have to continue dialoguing as a community. We have to keep working together. The solutions are there. We can make them. Thank um, you very much. Let's see, Ms. McHager, you start with this one. Please share your thoughts on the pros and cons of setting term limits for our elected and appointed positions in our city government. I personally would like term limits. I think, personally, I think we've all seen what a disaster our federal government is with people in those jobs for decades. I think we can handle a citizen government that puts in eight years and hand it on to someone else. I think we should all participate in it. Where we have our institutional memory is with our staff. We have staff in the city that has worked decades they carry the institutional memory. We all carry the institutional memory if we live here long enough. I've lived here for 34 years, 35 this month. We don't need to keep people in, in jobs, particularly volunteer jobs, for years and decades just because they might remember something that will be important. No, eight years is plenty. And I'm going to clarify that Ms. McHager is running for her first term, and Ms. Stinson is running for her third. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I disagree. And the reason I disagree is because uh, 
for the very reasons that were stated earlier in that we do need institutional knowledge and institutional uh, memory on council as well as on staff. Like you say, council sets the tone, not staff. And if you're only relying on staff to carry the institutional memory, then you're going to lose that. The other thing I would say is this is a difficult job. I mean, it's not something, I, you know, Amy mentioned it, everybody that's been on council, I know uh, council member Gray said, I'm only gonna run term, and then he realized, oh no, I'm just now getting up to speed, I need to stay on, and I, I respected that, because I understand that. The other thing is, there are things that some of us do that none of the others have done so far, and I, I, have, ha I have very unique experience right now that others don't have on council, and if you force that off, then you're gonna lose that particular experience. Um, that would be like within the emergency management realm, 911, that whole, that whole public safety beat has been mine for eight years, and there hasn't been anybody to kind of backfill on that. And I would like to say that my uh, opponent here about a year ago came up and lobbied against term limits when we were being asked to consider term limits for our advisory boards, where she had actually been serving for 10 years now. Um, she did lobby against um, imposing term limits for advisory boards and advisory board chairs for the very same reasons that I'm talking about, that during times of transition, you don't want to artificially force someone else. I agree, it's in your hands, you're the voters, you decide when it's time to change, not some arbitrary limit. Well, thank you for all the great questions that were submitted. I feel like it sparked a great dialogue here. Um, we are going to wrap up by having each candidate do a one-minute closing statement, and then this evening will be officially over. So um, without further ado, we, we are going to start with Ms. Stinson because you just answered the last question. So you'd go first this time. Okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. I started with the opening, too. So. Okay, so at this critical juncture, I do believe that council must have a balance of perspectives and experience. And looking at the current and potential council, I am the only member who has deep experience in public safety, climate change, and regional economic development. And those are all arenas that are critically important to our conti community's continued well-being. And I believe that my eight years of experience and knowledge and how all these systems link together, coupled with my positive associations with many organizations and individuals, make what I bring to the table particularly valuable right now. With dynamic change, we need a foundation of experienced and knowledgeable leadership. As I've demonstrated over the last eight years, I am totally committed to investing my time and effort for the good of our community. And you can trust that I will continue to do my homework and be ready to move our plans forward. I am confident that I'm the right candidate for this time, so please vote for me. Thank you. I want to thank everyone tonight here for being here and participating in this. This is what I love about citizen government. I'm gonna go back to my intro and finish it. If you are comfortable with what our city council has done in these last eight years, well, you know who to vote for. If you want change, vote for me. If you want change, you need to vote. That's how we'll get it. Thank you. Okay, let's give them each a big hand.